Thank you very much. Uh, surveys show that people, on average, fear public speaking more than they fear death. So there is a logical argument that if you shoot someone who's about to give a speech, you're doing them a favor. <laughs> now, my, uh, my theme for today is um, winning the global war for talent. Um, but let's back up a bit. And I'm going to give you three reasons why we no longer live in caves. And obviously, it's to do with um, change. I mean, if we had if we'd continued forever doing things the same way that we'd always done them before, uh, we'd, we'd still be living in caves, which means that uh, most of the people in this room would be dead. I mean, life expectancy in the cave-dwelling era was about 20 years. And uh, how many of you guys are under 20? <laughs> One. OK. Well, no, you're looking good, OK, but maybe not quite that good. Um, so what are the main disruptive forces that drive change? I, I would name three. There's technology. You, you invent a better mousetrap or a new way of organizing a company. There's trade, which is where you take the thing that you've invented and you spread it around the world by selling it to people. Uh, and then there's mobility, which is when people move from one place to another um, and spread the ideas that they had back home and pick up the ideas in the new place and maybe spread them back to the home that they came from. Um, and generally, that's how progress goes. Now, the interesting thing is, I mean, most of us, are we're, we're OK with the idea of technology. People, people approve of technology. I mean, that six-year-old son I mentioned before was, uh, he was watching a, a TV show uh, called The Horrible Histories recently, and there was a song on it. Um, about the Luddites, you know, the guys in... Uh, and, he, and he asked me, who, who, who were the Luddites? And I said, well, it was uh, in the 19th century. There were um, these people who uh, didn't like the invention of uh, machines for uh, making clothes uh, because they thought it would put them out of jobs because they were weavers. Um, and so they went around smashing the machines. And my six-year-old looked at me and he says, that's really stupid. And that, that pretty much summarizes the views of, of voters everywhere towards technology. They think it's a good thing, even if, you know, occasionally it's a bit disruptive. But strangely, the attitudes to trade tends to be completely different. You know, people say, oh, God, trade, you know, that's, that's very different. You know, Chinese people will, will make uh, cheap toys and that will put Canadian toy makers out of business. But it, it occurs to me that um, trade is almost indistinguishable from technology in terms of its effects. Think about it. You take uh, Canadian timber and you put it on a boat and you send it to China and then the boat comes back with televisions on it. Wow! Trade is this way of turning television, uh, sorry, timber into televisions. Now, if someone were to invent a machine that turned uh, timber into televisions, you'd say, wow, that deserves a Nobel Prize. I mean, you know, it deserves a Nobel Prize more than the European Union does. And, um, <laughs> sorry. And, um, and yet, you know, when you, when you have trade, people say, no, no, that's terrible. And they want to put up barriers and stop it from happening. Um, and with, with, with immigration, it's even worse, because, you know, immigration's very disruptive. Um, you have new people come to your country, and they, they talk funny languages, and they, and they look different, and, and, and maybe they cook food that's got lots of garlic in it and smells funny. Um, and so it's very disruptive, and people, people don't like it. But step back for a moment, OK? Try to imagine a world without disruption, a world, a place where you don't have to worry about the unsettling effect of uh, new ideas. Actually, I've been there. It's called North Korea. <laughs> now, I don't, know, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, North Korea. Okay, it's this sort of hermetically sealed uh, communist uh, dictatorship. They don't, they don't let people out, and they don't like to let people in either. It was quite difficult getting a visa, actually. I may not have been entirely truthful um, on my application form um, about what I was doing. Anyway, so you go there, and oh, man, it is awful. Um, to, give you, to give you an idea of, of, of how it works, I went into the library there, um, and we asked the librarian, so what kind of books do people like reading in, in North Korea? 
And the librarian said, well, of course, we, uh, we all like the, uh, the works of the great leader, Kim Il-sung, and, uh, and, and the works of his son, the dear leader, Kim Jong-il, uh, who have written many brilliant, hundreds of brilliant books on subjects ranging from uh, how to grow cabbages to how to make movies. And um, I said, yeah, yeah, I'm sure those are great books. Um, but are there any other authors that people like in North Korea? And the librarian went silent because he could not admit that there were any other authors that people might read. He could not admit that any good ideas might emanate from anyone outside the Kim dynasty. And that, in a nutshell, is why North Korea is so much poorer than South Korea. I mean, you know, in, in economics, you don't get to do very many controlled experiments, okay, because, you know, it's countries and things. But North Korea and South Korea are the closest that we have to a controlled experiment. And so you have one very closed country uh, where you can get, you know, sent to a labor camp for owning a shortwave radio, um, and one really open country. And I used to live there, and it was great, you know, um, such an open place, you know, loads and loads. I think 13% of uh, South Koreans study overseas. They're really receptive to ideas from the outside. And people were always asking me, I was quite young then, you know, when are you going to marry a nice Korean girl? Now, in North Korea, that would be a crime, okay? They're completely shut off. And so you have these two nations. Now, they share 5,000 years of history. I mean, you know, that, 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 makes, you know, that, that, that makes Britain look like Canada in terms of... <laughs> and they've got 5,000 years of shared history and culture. And, um, you know, until the end of World War II, North Korea was the slightly richer half, because that was where the Japanese occupiers um, built all their factories. But now, after you know, two generations of separation, one closed, the other open, um, South Korea is 20 times richer than North Korea. Not 20% richer, but 20 times richer. So, I mean, you know, South Korean mothers, you know, they worry about whether their kids are going to get into the right university. North Korean mothers worry about whether their kids are going to reach the age of five. So, that's what a, that's what a world without disruption is like. Now, Canada, in, in many ways, is, is like the opposite of, of North Korea. Very open to, to new ideas, very open to new people, um, very open to, to the outside world. In fact, it's in the past decade become more open than the United States, which has traditionally been the, the big magnet for migrants around the world. Now, I'll, I'll give you two examples that, that illustrate that. One is a, a guy called Surajit Sarkar. Now, he's, he's, a, he's a virologist uh, of Indian, uh, born in India, lives in Atlanta, um, and he does research into uh, the HIV, AIDS um, virus. He's trying to come up with a, a vaccine to prevent people from getting AIDS, which you might think was a moderately useful thing to be doing. However, so he's there in Atlanta, and he, he, he doesn't yet have a you know, formal residence. He doesn't have a green card. Um, and his, his father gets sick back in India. So he rushes home to India to be with his, his sick father. And then when he tries to come back to America, he's told, no, sorry, you can't come because there's been a security red flag on him. Why? Because he's a virologist. He knows about viruses, and, and you know, that, that sounds pretty dangerous, because if you know about viruses, you might be able to create a, a biological weapon and kill everyone, because you know, there are all these Hindu terrorists everywhere blowing up America all the time. Um, oh, no, there aren't. Um, and um, so he's got this problem. You know, the, the number of, since 9-11, the, the number of um, security checks on scientists like this has gone up 60-fold. Why has this happened? Well, I'll answer that question with another question. Um, who was the one official in the United States government who lost his job because of 9-11? Now, 9-11, you'd think, pretty big security lapse there. Um, and uh, so who, who was the person who lost their job? Was it someone at the CIA or someone at the NSA or someone at the Pentagon? No. It was the immigration official who renewed Mohammed Atta's passport. Now, think about the message that that sends. That tells everyone in the US Immigration Service that it is a career-ending mistake to let in a terrorist. But 
that you, you're not punished at all if you shut out um, the next Einstein or the next Sergey Brin, you know, the co-founder of Google, whose parents were, were from Russia. There's no, no penalty for that at all, um, and no, no, no reward for letting in good people. So the, 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 the incentives are entirely negative, okay? It's like, keep out, keep out, keep out, because you might be a terrorist. So Surajit Sarkar, he sits there for months and months and months, and they make him come up with his entire life. You know, they have documents of every, every paper he's ever written, every place he's ever been, everything he's ever done. He misses his daughter's first birthday party, all his experiments. Um, go to waste because you can't just leave, you know, virus experiments in their petri dishes for months. They they, they go off. You get scooped. Um, he was lucky not to lose his job. Many, in fact, probably most people in his situation do lose their jobs, and then they get fed up and they go somewhere else, like Canada, for example. Now, here's an example. Okay, Mohammed Al Borno. He did go to Canada. He's an Egyptian-born entrepreneur. And he came up with this, this really good idea for um, a, a, an online company that would connect makers of online videos uh, with customers for those things. You know, advertisers, companies, you need that stuff. It's really good, you know, putting, putting artists in touch with money, always a good thing. Um, and uh, so he had this great idea. And he managed to impress the really tough, stern-faced judges of one of the big um, entrepreneur contests. And he managed to impress some hard-nosed venture capitalists to put up real money to back this idea. And he managed to register his company uh, in Delaware, which is amazingly easy to do. Um, but he couldn't get permission to come into the United States and run the company he was trying to run. Um, you know, this. Entrepreneurs have this problem all the time because the, you know, the immigration people in the United States, they say, well, you know, can you prove that your startup will be able to pay you your salary for the next 10 years? You know, well, no, it's a startup. <laughs> and so they don't come in, instead of which, okay, Mohammed, he comes to Canada. He's in Vancouver now. He's running his company. It's successful. He says he's delighted to be here because Canada is welcoming people. He says Vancouver is this wonderful, vibrant place with amazing sort of, you know, startups and, and a buzz and nice food. Um, and so he's very happy he came here. If, he wanted to, if I wanted to show you one graph that illustrates why Canada um, can outcompete the United States, this would be it. Just, just look at that. Um, you've got the proportion of visas that are granted for economic reasons and how it's changed over the past two decades. Um, Canada and the United States, back in 1991, it's about the same. You know, 20% for economic reasons, all the rest for family reunification and that sort of thing. Um, and then over the next two decades, America slowly creeping downwards to about 15%. So 85% of visas in the United States are for family reunions. These are green cards. Um, and very little attention paid to skills. Canada, the opposite. It's gone up to two-thirds now uh, on the basis of work. So, you know, if you were to compare these two countries to companies, their hiring policies, Canada would be like Google. You know, you take skilled people, no matter where they come from, and you hire them. And the United States would be a bit more like... Uh, well, think of a really fusty old bank where you kind of know that the successor to the chairman is going to be the chairman's son because, you know, family ties are what matter. Now, which of those do you think is a more promising approach? Canada has become a, a magnet for talent, okay? The foreign-born population here has shot up uh, since 1990 from 4.5 million people to uh, 7.2 million people. That's one in five Canadians was born somewhere else. That is a higher proportion than the United States. You see cities here like uh, Toronto and Vancouver, where the foreign-born portion of the population is, is getting up close to half. It's substantially higher than New York. And New York is a city that's so proud of its history as a place that welcomes immigrants. They've even got a big statue next to the harbor advertising the fact. And yet somehow Canada's just snuck up behind them and got these amazing melting pots going there. And the, the, the people you're welcoming, you know, that's a clever bunch of people. Half of them have, have college degrees compared to about a fifth of, of native-born Canadians. And, and they're really happy to be here as well. 85% of them are choosing to become citizens. Canada is clearly doing something right here. 
And what about Alberta? I mean, Alberta, it's kind of like Canada, but more so. Okay, it's an electromagnet for talent, if you will. Um, it's, it's not only Canada's energy capital, but it's also becoming like a kind of mini United Nations. I was up in uh, Fort McMurray yesterday. And it's great. I mean, I love frontier towns. Um, and um, and this, this was... No, seriously, because it's, it's fun. You know, stuff's changing. And they're, and they're boasting to me about how, you know, they've got 127 different nationalities there, and there are 69 different languages being spoken. Um, <clears throat> And you can see it everywhere you look. I mean, you know, the, the engineers are coming from everywhere. They got a whole bunch of them came in from Venezuela after Chavez decided to mess up the, the oil industry there. You've got people from, you know, Arab countries. You've got Indians, Chinese, Japanese. There's good sushi restaurants. There are people, you know, serving in the, the shops who are wearing full chador. It's, it's, it's amazingly multicultural. And you've got, you know, West Africans working in Walmart there. Fantastic place. Um, what, what, what they haven't got uh, in Fort McMurray is um, it's not, it's, it doesn't have quite that sort of feeling of a mature, um, mature kind of city. It's uh, the sex balance is, shall we say, not one to one. Um, and the, um, <clears throat> you know, you've got an awful lot of young men there, which is, you know, great if you like young men. Um, and, but it's not quite so good on. Um, it's not quite so good on, you know, family houses and, and schools and things like that. And this is very important, you know. If you want to, if you want to, there's a lot of it, attention given to bringing in the skilled migrants who know about the oil industry. You know, the geologists, the the engineers, the mining engineers, the people who know how to operate the big trucks and that kind of thing. But if you want to, if you want to make this a sort of permanent thing, if you want to make this the kind of place where you don't have to pay people twice the prevailing wage to go and work there, if you want to make it livable. You have to have other kind of people as well. You have to have people who can build houses. And there's a desperate need for housing in Fort McMurray. Okay, and okay, there's the problem that provincial government sort of not letting them build on, on, on land, but you could still build upwards. Actually, the provincial government probably ought to let them build outwards as well, because, I mean, you know, if you want an oil industry, you want people to run it. But you need, you need, you need carpenters and electricians, um, and you need also quality of life. You know, people doing quality of life professions, people running shops and hairdressers and teaching in schools. And you want to, you know, you can get them from anywhere in the world. Let them all in. Um, you know, the two fastest growing metro areas uh, in Canada are uh, Calgary and Edmonton. Um, and there's this, this great potential here for um, using the natural resources that you've got. And these, these are really exciting at the moment. I'll, I'll get onto that a bit more later. But you know, using that as a way of attracting people here and then building you know, a, a talented, thriving community on the basis of that. Now, not everyone approves of the, the influx of people into Alberta and the way it's being handled. There's a quote here from uh, Gil McGowan, the president of the uh, Alberta Federation of Labor. Uh, is he in the room? No. OK. Um, Anyway, so he said um, <clears throat> that Alberta has joined um, a global underground railway trading in human misery, that we're becoming the Dubai or the Saudi Arabia of the north, not only because we have oil, but because we're abandoning real immigration in favor of using an exploitative guest worker program to fill our most menial and undesirable jobs. Now, um, if I was going to be mean, I would point out that the uh, Underground Railway was a way of getting people out of slavery, but I'm not, so I'm not going to say that. Um, <clears throat> I would take, uh, respectfully take a bit of issue with this, because um, you know, all the people coming here, okay, they're coming here voluntarily. They're coming here because they think they're going to be better off. Um, and if they don't like it, they can go home. Um, and generally they come because they feel they can earn a lot of money and then they can send that money home. And when they send that money home, they will be benefiting the countries that they've come from by you know, putting their nieces through medical school and putting a, a roof over their family's head and paying their mother's medical bills and things like that. I mean, generally, this idea that there's a big brain drain that's damaging poor countries is simply not true. Um, but, you know, it's, if you're Canadians, you're thinking about what's good for Canada. And what's good for Canada, actually, is that you probably, I mean, a temporary worker program is, is better than nothing, but actually what you really want uh, is to build a community, and that means giving people a clear path to, to citizenship if they want to stay. And if they want to just work here for a while and go home, that's okay too. It's not 
just about, I mean, openness is not just about being open to people. You've got to be open to money, too. Now, I know it seems a bit silly having to say to people, you've got to be open to money, because, I mean, who's not open to money? Someone comes up and gives you, you know, a thousand bucks, you're happy, right? But um, when it comes to foreign investment, a lot of places are very sensitive about the idea of foreigners owning, um, you know, their strategic industries. And that's why, you know, we're having that the hoo-ha at the moment about uh, Sinuk wanting to buy Nexen. That's why uh, Petronas wasn't allowed to buy uh, Progress Energy and why uh, BHP, which comes from a very scary country called Australia, um, was not allowed to buy potash. Now, I can sort of see with a state-owned Chinese company like Sinuk why you might be a bit nervous, okay? Because it's a state-owned company from a hideous dictatorship with an appalling human rights record, um, and it's, you know, horribly subsidized in lots of unfair ways, um, and, you know, they're probably coming here to steal our technology, okay? But, you know, although all of that's true, um, that's actually not a very good reason for telling them to go away. Okay, let's, let's go through it bit by bit. Um, they're a, a hideous state-owned company. Yeah, but they're pretty competently run. Um, and the fact that they're subsidized means that, okay, Chinese savers are being ripped off because, you know, they get very low interest rates for their savings, and Chinese um, taxpayers are being ripped off because the state-owned companies, you know, absorb so much money and don't give any of it to the Chinese people. But the Canadians are not being ripped off. What you're getting um, is subsidized capital that's been subsidized by someone else that is very long-term capital, it's very patient capital, it's exactly the sort of capital that, that people complain that capitalism doesn't throw up. Um, it's very interested in developing what you've got here. Um, and, you know, you need all the help you can get. And the idea about, you know, they're coming here to steal our technology, well, let's, let's just phrase it a bit differently, shall we? Um, they want to learn from the best. Why do they want to learn from the best? Well, probably for the same reason that many of you would want your children to go to Harvard or McGill. Um, because, you know, you want to learn from the best. That way you get better. And it's not going to be just one way. China, you know, produces more engineers, graduates more engineers every year than any other country on earth. So, you know, do you really think you're going to have nothing to learn from these people in, in the... Uh, in the Wall Street Journal this week, there was that great story about um, Sinopec, another state-owned Chinese company who were um, they, they're building a, a high-tech facility in Wyoming to turn coal into gasoline. Fantastic stuff. There's lots of stuff that you can learn from them. Um, and the counterexample, okay? If you try to keep capital from elsewhere out, you retard your own growth. And here, a good example is Mexico. I was down in Mexico a couple of weeks ago. And um, the way they have messed up their oil industry by saying, you know, it's enshrined in the Mexican constitution that, you know, the oil assets belong to the Mexican people. And therefore, you can't have anyone from the outside owning any of them, because that would be bad. Um, and so what happens? You know, the, the Pemex, the state-owned oil company, um, is horribly run. That's not my opinion. That's the opinion of the boss of Pemex when we interviewed him. Um, it's starved of capital. So they've got all this fantastic um, you know, deep sea oil in the Gulf of Mexico that they'd like to exploit. But they don't have the capital or the technology to do it. So you contrast what they're doing with what Brazil's doing with deep water drilling. And Brazil has managed to drill five times as many wells over the same period as Mexico. So don't be like Mexico. There's a huge amount of capital out there. There's masses of cash looking for a home. Now, this is a, a story we did recently about the cash leading, leaving China, and uh, it's called the, the Flight of the Runminbi. Sorry, you know, journalists, we spend a lot of time thinking up very bad puns. Um, why is so much money trying to get out of China? A couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, interest rates are artificially low uh, in Chinese banks you know, because the government wants the money to go to state-owned companies, uh, which will then give jobs to members of the Communist Party. Um, cynical, but true. So lots of, if you want to get return on your savings in China, um, either you buy property or you try to get money out of the country. That's why the casinos in uh, Macau and Singapore are so much bigger than the casinos in Las Vegas, because casinos are great ways of laundering money. You, know, you just go in, put your chips in, get cash out, change it, and bam, you, know, you can get the money out of the country. But that's not the only reason. 
Um, it's also because you don't have secure property rights in China. If you're you know, an entrepreneurial Chinese guy, um, if you've um, built a company, made a fortune, you're absolutely terrified that one day someone in power is going to turn around and say, I want that. I mean, you read the story of uh, Bo Xilai recently, the guy from Chongqing. Okay, I mean, he was the, the top Communist Party official in uh, a city that, you know, got the same population as Canada. It's a really big deal. He was in line to join the Standing Committee of the Politburo uh, until recently. And he was Al Capone. I mean, his, the way he ran his town was that he, uh, he ran a, a quote, anti-corruption campaign. Which consisted of rounding up all the rich people in town, having them tortured, um, and making them hand over their assets either to him or to his friends. He became spectacularly wealthy doing this. He was only caught because his wife murdered a foreigner and it got into the foreign press. But, you know, so the Chinese government, okay, they've, they've kicked him out of the Communist Party and they're saying that this is totally atypical, this kind of thing doesn't happen very often. But, you know, even though it's quite extreme, uh, it's actually pretty typical because you have a country where officials are accountable only upwards to their superiors um, in Beijing and not at all accountable downwards to the people, which means that they can plunder and rob them with impunity. Now, if you live in a situation like that, you want to find a way of getting some of your assets somewhere else. And that's why, according to the Huron Report, which is the Chinese equivalent of uh, Forbes magazine, most Chinese millionaires have either applied for a foreign passport um, or are thinking about doing so. It's not because they want to leave China, it's because they want to have the option of leaving China. And these are, uh, by and large, rich, hard-working, clever people. And if they come knocking on your door, you should welcome them and their money. Now, immigrants, okay, they bring, they bring dynamism and youth and energy and entrepreneurial spirit, but that's not all. They also bring connections. Now here it's really important to note where your immigrants are coming from. And Canada's really well set up here because the top five um, suppliers of immigrants to Canada, uh, three of them, are China, India, and the United States. Now those are, uh, I suspect, going to be the three most important economies over the next half century. Um, and when immigrants from these places come here, they uh, create bridges between Canada and these countries. And that, that's very important. Why is that important? Well, for starters, it's because emerging markets, that's where the growth is, you know? I mean, six-sevenths of humanity live in emerging markets, and that's where all the catch-up growth is coming. In rich countries, you know, they can't grow that fast. I mean, I know, you know, you hear about China slowing down, and I mean, I, I was in Tianjin about a month ago, and, you know, the talk was of little else. Oh, my gosh, China's slowing down to 7% growth a year. I mean, that's still twice what any mature... Uh, economy can manage. So that's where the growth is. Western companies, you know, have glittering opportunities in these places. Um, firstly, to sell things to the newly emerging global million, middle class. That's the billions of people who are just starting to think about buying, you know, their first microwave oven, their first car, their first Blackberry. Okay, it's fantastic opportunities for selling to these people, and also opportunities to use, you know, Chinese imported parts and Indian backroom services to make your own products more competitive. Fantastic, fantastic opportunities. How big is this opportunity? Well, uh, factory wages in China are rising by about 20% a year. Okay, now if you think if you're growing at 10% a year, you're doubling every seven years. This is a fantastic growth rate for their wages, and they want to buy stuff. What do they want to buy? Well, first of all, they want to buy Western brands because they're prestigious. You know, you, you hang around in China for a while, you see, okay, the people who can afford Apple products are buying Apple products, and the people who can't buy them, okay, they're buying those, those little fake um, Apple covers to put over their other smartphones. Not Blackberries, of course, which are more prestigious than Apple products, but, you know, other smartphones, okay? And they, they put them on so it looks like you're wearing an iPhone, even though you're not. Um, but the other thing that they really like about Western products is they, they have a trust in Western brands. Now, this really matters in the field of food safety. Now, some of you may have noticed the quote at the bottom of the slide there. This was, um, I was, I was sitting there. Uh, in a restaurant in China, talking to my, my correspondent from, from Shanghai. And he said, he said, Robert, 
you've got to hope that you know your milk has been adulterated with cow's urine because because everything else they put into the milk is worse i'm like oh thanks <laughs> i think i think i have the black coffee actually um and um <clears throat> but this is this is true okay i mean you have you know a lot of people in china are trying to make a quick buck and one of the ways you can you know um cut corners when distributing milk is to adulterate it with cheaper things. Um, and some of these cheaper things are deadly. And from time to time, you have sort of mass poisonings. And the way that the Chinese government deals with this is it waits until there has been a mass poisoning, and then it rounds up a few people and shoots them. And um, the problem with this approach uh, is it's a bit scattershot. Your chances of being caught are very small, so it doesn't really deter very much work. So what the Western multinationals do there um, it's quite different. I mean, I was talking to the guys at Nestle, and they have people, they send people to the farm gate, and they check, they test all the milk at the farm gate, and they put it on a tanker, and then they test it again at the factory door. And if there's anything wrong with it, they junk the entire load, and then they go back to the farmers, and they keep very careful track of which farmers put their milk into which tanker, and they say, right, that stuff was adulterated. You're not getting paid. And you know, that message, that's pretty immediate, that gets to them quickly, and that means that nobody gets killed by Nestle powdered milk. And, you know, a lot of Chinese people are pretty patriotic and would rather buy Chinese brands. But there is no tiger mother, okay, who is prepared to risk um, harming her own baby for patriotic reasons. So Western milk companies have more than half the market in China. It's a fantastic opportunity for selling food. And, you know, it occurs to me that uh, Canada might be quite good at this. So... The problem with doing business in emerging markets is that they're very tough to do business in. Okay? One of the problems is that you tend not to have the rule of law. And we totally take it for granted in the West that you can do business with strangers. Because if there's a problem, uh, you can go to court uh, and it will be solved in a fair and equitable manner. And, and because you can rely on the courts, it, generally your business partners don't cheat you. This is simply not true in the emerging world. In China, the courts serve the ruling party. In India, the courts are so slow that you will be dead before your, so your case is resolved. So that's not very useful. And in Africa, and Africa, remember, is the, the continent that's been fastest growing of all the continents over the past decade. Enormous opportunities there. But it's very difficult to find any institutions at all that are honest. Now, I'll give you an example of that, OK? I once hitched a lift on a beer truck in Cameroon. And we had this sort of simple uh, schedule, which said we, we were taking these 30,000 bottles of Guinness, and we were going to deliver them to, um, from the port city of Douala to a, uh, a, a village in the rainforest. And it was about 300 uh, miles, and our rather optimistic schedule said that it was going to take about um, uh, 18 hours to do it. Now, it took four days. Why? Well, partly it's because the roads weren't very good. Um, you know, they were kind of dirt tracks, which was fine so long as it didn't rain. But we were in a rainforest. So it uh, rained rather often, turning the roads into impassable swamps. But the main reason that it took so long was that we were stopped 47 times at police roadblocks. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with... Um, you know, West African police roadblock, but you come along and there's a, you know, load of barbed wire and old fridges and oil drums and things in the middle of the road. And so you come to a stop and the gendarme, the policeman gets up from underneath the tree and he ambles over and he kicks your tires and uh, looks at your axles and your paperwork to see if he can find something that you're doing wrong so that he can start the uh, slow process of negotiation about how much it's going to cost you. Uh, for him to overlook this thing. And, you know, the amount of time you waste is incredible. There was one place where I think, you know, there was three of us in the cab, me, the driver, the driver's mate, seven policemen, okay, and we were held for three and a half hours. So that's like 35 man hours wasted. I mean, call it, you know, one French working week. Um, and... <laughs> And this was, this, was, this was all for, you know, they were asking for a bribe of about $10 or something. Um, anyway, the, the, the policeman at roadblock number 31 came up with the pithiest explanation as to why things work this way. Uh, he made up a rule about carrying passengers in beer trucks, which obviously we'd broken. Um, and I put it to him, I said, look, this, this rule about not carrying passengers in beer trucks, you, you just made that up, right? And, and he looked at me 
and he patted his holster and he said, do you have a gun? I said, well, no, I'm English. I don't have a gun. Um, and, um, and he said, well, I have a gun, so I know the rules. And I thought that was a great explanation of, you know, <laughs> how it works. Now, can you imagine what it's like doing business in a place where the rule of law is like that? And, and you know, Cameroon's a pretty extreme example, but this is a, a common problem throughout emerging markets. So how do you get around that? You need a guide. You need someone who can show you what to do, who, can, who, who knows the local culture, who knows the local language, and, this is very important, who knows the local people, who knows who you can trust. You know, is that official a crook? Um, you know, if it's bullshit, lie, just don't do business with him because his wife will murder you, okay? Um, and if, if, or is it someone trustworthy? The local company, is that, is that a company you can deal with or a company you can't deal with? These are things you can't find out by Googling, right? Um, but it's not just that you have to find people who know the local area. They have to know you as well. They have to understand your culture, your way of doing business. What you need is people who have worked or lived or studied in your own country, or at least in the West. Who are these people? Immigrants. There is an unbelievable amount of evidence out there that if you want to do business in emerging markets, you have to have people who know the area. I mean, there was uh, um, William Kerr from the Harvard Business School did a study showing that uh, North American companies that hired Chinese immigrants um, found it much easier to do business in China without the crutch of a joint venture, and that meant they kept more of the profit than they would if they had to go into a joint venture. Um, there are spectacular, pardon me, um, spectacular many examples of this. There's one killer stat, okay? 70% of the direct investment, foreign direct investment that goes into China passes through the overseas Chinese. And here's a story that can illustrate this point. There's a lady called Chung Yan um, who emigrated, a Chinese lady, went to America about 20 years ago. And with her outsider's eye, she saw two things. She made two observations. One was that Americans throw out lots of waste paper, you know, lots of um, you know, junk mail and political leaflets and instruction manuals for barbecue sets and, and uh, you know, old issues of The Economist they haven't quite got around to reading yet. Um, so that was one thing. And the other thing she noticed was there are lots of ships that go from... Uh, China to America fully laden and then go back half empty because the things that China sells uh, take up a lot of space, you know, steel girders and, and ball bearings and the must-have toy for Christmas, whereas the things that the United States uh, sells to China tend to be uh, pretty weightless. I mean, you're talking, you know, uh, intellectual property and Hollywood movies and IOUs from the government. Um, <laughs> and so she put these two facts together, right? and created a multi-billion dollar business out of it. She gathered up all the waste paper she could get hold of in America. She loaded it into those half-empty ships. She sent it to China. She used her contacts in China to set up a factory to recycle it into cardboard boxes. And you then take those cardboard boxes, you can put televisions in them, and you can send them back to America. Her business, Nine Dragons Paper, has made her one of the richest self-made women in the world. Um, and you can't say whether this is a Chinese company or an American company, it's both. It spans both. Both countries benefit from it. This is a cover story we did a while back about uh, you know, migrant business networks. And you see there's the penguins who are obviously a bit far away from home um, but, and, you know, in the rainforest. But they're arriving ready to do business. They've got um, you know, mobile phones and, and computers and things. So uh, yeah, that's a cover art for you. A mobile world is a smarter world. People, you know, they, they move across borders, they communicate with the places that they came from. We're in, I think, a new age of migration. It used to be that people would uh, get on a boat and they'd sail across uh, the Atlantic and then pretty much lose touch with the places that they came from. Because, you know, a couple of generations ago, a transatlantic telephone call would cost you more than a month's wages, and cheap flights didn't exist. Nowadays, that's just not true anymore. People, you know, as soon as the plane hits the tarmac, your new immigrant will be texting his mother. He can follow, um, you know, soap operas from the old country on his laptop. He can send money home in minutes if he wants to do a cross-border business with his, his brother or his cousin. And because communications are so easy now, um, it means that migrants stay in touch with the places that they are from. 
And that means they help their new countries stay in touch with the places that they're from. So where's Canada in all this? I make two conclusions here. One is, you know, we fret about it being an aging society, but that's not such a bad thing. It means you're not dying young, okay? I mean, for me, I prefer that. Um, but yes, you do want a bit of a, an injection of um, youth into your society, and you can get that for free very easily with immigration. Okay? In the future, I'm going to make a bold prediction here, but the world population is going to peak um, at about uh, 9 billion, and then it's going to start going down sometime mid-century. Why? Because every time any nation reaches a certain level of development, people stop having so many children. It's happened in every rich country. Okay? World population is to start going down. And then the size of each country is going to be determined more and more by whether people want to live there. And here, Canada has a huge advantage because, you know, it's a pretty nice place to live. You look at all the, the indices of, of, of livability of cities and, um, you know, Canadian cities always rank very near the top, okay? And Canada has the opportunity to, to pick, hire the best brains from the entire world to come and work here, okay? And that's... That, that's a fantastic um, foundation on which to build a prosperous society. It's a much more reliable, long-term foundation, even than Canada's immense uh, resource wealth, because, you know, the prices of commodities go up and down, but the demand for talent, the demand for, for, for brains, that just keeps going up and up. So, not long ago, The Economist did a cover about Canada, where we said that, um, you know, it's a rather cool. It's looking rather cool. The question is, can it maintain that? And I would argue that it can, because Canadians, it seems to me, have, have understood that in the global war for talent, the most potent weapon that we have is a welcome mat. Thank you very much. <laughs>